So welcome to our Parent Night 2020. Uh, so just want to go over the format a little bit as I did a little bit here. We're going to generally overview the program as well as have a Q&A. In the second hour will be a more specific breakdown of the IV diploma and requirements for them. So that's going to really matter for the seniors and the parents of seniors who are here. Um, but any cohort nine members or family members who are uh, interested and want to know what to expect from the program, that's going to be useful for you as well. All right, so what is IB, right? It stands for International Baccalaureate. It is a two-year program at Granada um, in terms of the diploma program. We'll talk about that a little bit coming up. When we like to put an emphasis on community, collaboration, and college support. Those are sort of the three C's, the three pillars of our program and what we focus on a ton. That's what, when we had C14 as our office space on campus, that's what uh, Cindy and I would talk about on a daily basis are some level of these three things. So um, Ms. Quintana and I still talk regularly. Um, Ms. Jimenez and I have spoken less now that we've got the schedule sorted out, uh, but that, you know, we were in constant contact at the start of the school year, uh, working to get our students the best schedules possible for them, for their interests, and for their college transcripts or rather college applications. Um, and that's a really big part of, of what we do. And our goal on the, in this program is not necessarily to emphasize any one of these things over the other. We're not looking, you know, to build, uh, you know, like we don't measure our success based on student college acceptances, not even close, but it is something that we're aiming to do and something I think we're getting better at uh, every day. So one co common question for IB is how is it similar or different to AP? Um, all HL, we have two, two levels of classes, HL and SL, higher level and standard level. And all of your HL classes are going to give you the same GPA boost as AP classes. And they're looked at really at the same level of rigor for uh, college applications as well. Your SL classes are going to give you a half point GPA boost, and that's the same as the honors level. But we only really have three classes that are weighted at SL on your transcript. So there's TOK, which we try to get all of our IB students to take. Uh, there are the language courses for students in their third year, and there's the mathematics courses. Uh, two of them are offered at the SL level, one of them is HL. So, and the thing about uh, language courses is a student's senior year will be higher level. So you'll hear uh, I've got a 14 month old son uh, and it's, it's close to bath time, so we're probably going to be hearing some background noise. Um, I might end up moving locations, but there's not too many locations to go to. Um, okay, so that, that's sort of how it's going to look on transcripts. And I would add that right now, looking at the transcripts for IB students uh, after their junior years, we are looking at a very real possibility that we'll have yet again another um, IB student as the top uh, speaker at graduation. Um, we'll see about that. Obviously they have to continue to do well this semester, but it's interesting because the GPA boosts to our IB students get from, from those, I'll put it back up, from these classes, even though you know people are gonna worry like, what about the SL and things? In general, because we take seven courses and because of these GPA boosts, our students uh, end up having the highest GPAs on campus. Sometimes academic kids, academic decathlon kids do as well. But uh, the last, I want to say three, Ms. Quintana, has it been three graduation speakers? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, or valedict valedictorians have been IB students. Um, okay, so that's how it's going to look in your grade books. It's going to look very similar to, um, to what what you've come to expect from Granada over the first two years of your student's uh, career there. Um, but for IB scores, you're gonna see things a little bit differently. So IB grades things on a one to seven scale. So if you're familiar with AP, they do one to five, IB does one to seven. Actually AP does zero to five, but. 
Uh, for most courses, this is a combination of work done over two years. So for instance, I'm an English teacher. Uh, I work with students for two years um, and their subject score is based off of uh, internal assessments that we provide uh, for English that is an oral presentation. Um, same thing for other language courses. Uh, certain courses, you know, your art classes have different types of internal assessment. Our science classes use labs. Um, history does a really good research paper. Um, but that also includes external assessments as well, which are the May exams. And we'll talk about that more, uh, especially in the second hour. A four and above is what we consider passing for IB scores. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about IB scores in college as well, because I know that's a common question. So if you start talking to your kid about what they're going through in class, you're going to hear a lot of different uh, initialisms, right? So we've got to, I'm going to break down sort of the IB, ABCs. First, DP is the diploma program. You might not hear the kids talk about that very much, but you might hear it from me. Um, that's what your 11th and 12th graders are enrolled in. Um, at the end of it, hopefully, we get an IB diploma. So you might be wondering what on earth is an IB diploma, right? Do they still get a GHC diploma? Yes, they still get a GHC diploma. Um, but the IB diploma is, I don't have it here. We have my, I'm in my wife's office here. Oops, sorry, hit the key. An IB diploma, um, I have mine. I was an IB student, Quartz Hill High School, 2002. Um, which I know is, it's crazy now because the, all the students are younger than that. And that's, that's wild to me now. But um, okay, so IB diploma, it's just another sheet of paper is what it is. But it can get you, uh, your scores on that can get you access uh, to units in college. And we'll break that down a little bit more coming up. Uh, you still get your Granada diploma, but it's just one more thing to, to mention. It's another sort of accolade or award to add to college applications and it is internationally recognized. So for students who might be interested in applying to colleges out of the country, uh, this is something that they're going to recognize and they're going to understand, whereas they might not understand exactly what Granada offers. You might also hear about our middle years program, our MYP uh, on Granada. It's grades six through 10 of the IB program and at the high school campus, we're calling it our pre-IB program right now. Uh, I think we have about, Melissa says, about, what, about 140 kids in the program? 145. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we, we've got a similar number, just slightly more in the diploma program. So that's coming down the, the pipes, um, but we're not going to talk too much about the MYP here tonight, just because this is the diploma program night. All right, so IAs. Uh, parents of seniors are definitely going to hear about this a lot because senior year, there are a lot of IAs and they're a big assignment. They're a big cause of stress. Um, and that's probably because it's the most important initialism. It's that most important acronym in IB. Internal assessment means they are done in class. What I mean by that is they are signed in class. They're not, not all teachers do it all in class. For my English class, we do. I know the history teachers spend a lot of time in class working on it. Um, the science teachers, you know, work on the labs, they're graded by your student's teacher. They're graded by me, by whoever is teaching them. Um, so it's a chance to work with the student and get to know them and give them a score. That score contributes to about 20 to 40%, depending on the subject, of your overall IB subject score. Remember, that's the one to seven. So unlike an AP test, which is going to determine your entire subject score for that course at the end of the year in one sitting, IB's got a little bit more going into it so that your student has more chances for success. I say it's the most important initialism in IB because doing a good job, even though like 20% doesn't seem like a big deal, if your student can really crush the IA, that's going to put them in position to just kind of coast to a, to a passing score. Uh, for the for the other assessments not that the kind of student who crushes the ia is going to then coast for the rest of you know for the other exams but it just takes some of the pressure off so you heard me say external assessment those are our eas 
Uh, we do have a few EAs that are assigned and done during the school year in class. Um, they're for some of the electives, like art has a few EAs. Uh, language courses used to have them, but they've taken them away. Um, our English course still does. We write a literary essay. My seniors will be working on that at the start of the spring semester. Um, and then the main one, the big one, is the TOK essay. Oops, I'm sorry. Uh, that also, the other external assessments are also our May exams. So just like AP tests have a test at the end of the year, we have a test in May too. What those tests will look like this year, or you know, 2021, remains to be determined. We'll talk about that more later on today. So I've said TOK a few times. Uh, TOK is the theory of knowledge. It is a course that is crucial to the IB curriculum. It's an epistemology course, which is about understanding not what we know, but how we know it. How do we gain knowledge? Not all of our students are able to take this course because of conflicts sometimes with things like robotics programs or um, ASB. But in general, we try to get every IB student to take at least one year of this two-year course just because it is so foundational to, um, to, to the way we learn in the IB program. Uh, I was speaking with a student who's currently at UCLA. She was a member of cohort seven and uh, she was emailing me for something else, but she said, by the way, I just wanted to say, I, I know you said it all the time, Mr. Lewis, but IB really did prepare me to have success here at UCLA. I already feel like I'm ahead of my classmates because of IB. And one of the classes she pointed to specifically, she said was TOK. And she said, the way the course is taught um, the way that it was, it's about critical thinking, it's about metacognition, she said really is helping her out in her first year classes at UCLA. Um, that's a UCLA sociology major. Um, I, I can agree, you know, I, like I said, I was a um, IB student in, in my high school, Courts Hill, and I went to UC Santa Barbara and I definitely felt very prepared for that. Um, extended essay is a, 4,000 word research project written on a subject of a student's choosing. Uh, it sounds daunting for many of the students. It will be the largest thing they've ever written in their lives. Um, and it will continue to be the, the largest thing they've written in their lives, maybe until grad school. Uh, but it is a really eye-opening experience. It's something we're going to be starting this fall with the seniors. Uh, it gets started in earnest during winter break. Um, but it seems daunting, but the reality is, is that the students who embrace it and choose you know, a subject that they really are interested in have a ton of fun with this assignment. And it's, it's, it speaks to the type of students we get that they're able to embrace this love of learning and love for research. All right, so another common question we get for, stu uh, for parents is what they can do to help their student. Right. Um, I know when I sit down with a, a student who is, um, you know, an HL math or something and they're, and they're struggling or really, you know, I mentioned I'm an English teacher, really they're in any math and their class and they're struggling. There's, there's only so much I can do to help. Right. And the same is true for just about every subject except for, you know, English, uh, history and sometimes biology. But like, even then I'm going back to, to high school where it was my favorite subject. And so it's like, Apart from that, if they're struggling, there's not much I can do to help them, right? And you, I imagine, are feeling kind of similar sometimes when they're talking to you about these classes and it's like, man, it's been a long time since I've been in school. I don't, I don't remember. Uh, so we can't always help them with the homework, but there are lots and lots of ways we can help our students. So the first is, and this is where I'm missing, uh, Ms. Quintana, the, uh, the in-person reactions. Cause, the uh, laughter. Yeah, because... <laughs> I like to, uh, you know, we say set a bedtime of no later than 11 p.m. And this is when we get the eye rolls. Um, right? Like my kid's up till two or three doing the homework. I understand. But that there's really got to be some, some time for the student to sleep. Uh, we, we put so much of an emphasis on grades. And, you know, there's so much that seems like all this homework has to get done or else the grade won't be done. But the reality is that for your IB classes, 
Grades are based on knowledge and understanding. Your assessments are going to matter so much more than your homework for the most part. And so like an incomplete homework assignment is, is more or less better than an incomplete night of sleep. Right. I know that's what I'd rather see for my students now. Yeah. Sometimes when something majors do, we've, we're going to stay up late working on it. But for the most part, I love to hear from students who are in bed really by 10 PM, but we say uh, no later than 11 PM because we're realists as well. Uh, we got to find these, this balance between academics and personal hobbies. Um, this is not just because it's good for a kid. It is good for a kid to find this balance and we want what's best for our students. Absolutely. And I know you do too. Uh, we need to have, you know, things that interest us personally. But I'm going to put it out there. Colleges want to see students who are well balanced as well. So that might not include things like video games, but they want students to have more going on to their lives than just uh, the homework in front of them. There are more important things or there, maybe I should say this, there are equally important things as school in your student's life. Um, be mind, we ask, you know, I, we, the teachers, uh, collaborate together to make sure that we're not putting assessments on top of each other so that they don't have four major essays due all at one time. Um, most times we're able to do that. Uh, we kind of ask that you do the same at home as well, right? So if you know they're, they're stressed out over something, maybe we can help like lighten the load at home a little bit one way or another. We also understand that that's not always, always possible, but it does help to uh, communicate with your child ahead of time so that you know when those stressful times are coming along. For any parents of seniors in here right now, we know the current stress is coming from the college apps, uh, especially, and that's gonna continue to ramp up through October. Uh, you know, the most basic thing you can do, sit down and ask your student what they learned in school that day. Um, what did you talk about? What did you guys discuss? What did you learn? What was interesting? I know what they're gonna say. They're gonna say, mm, not much. But they said they learned something. Ask them. Um, so we encourage students to attend tutoring after school. What that's going to look like is still kind of in flux, but there's still going to be opportunities for students to, to get that extra help, and we encourage, encourage them to get it when they need it. By the way, our first grading session is ending this Friday. We're going to have an idea of students who are sort of sinking or swimming. If your student isn't where they want to be, the time to get help is now. Not, not at the end of the semester. Um, if, you're, if there's an issue, if there's an issue with a teacher, if there's an issue with um, other students, if there's an issue with your student, bring it to the teacher or bring it to me. Um, I'm always available via email. You guys are here, so you've got my email already. S. Lewis at GHCTK12. Uh, Ms. Quintana is available for uh, community service related issues. C Quintana at ghctk12.com. And then uh, Ms. Jimenez is available for any sort of scheduling issues, mjimenez at ghctk12.com. Um, these students and Ms. Quintana is gonna talk about our community service projects uh, later, but they've got some really great stuff going on. So I really encourage you to ask them about it and get involved if you can, um, it's, it's really good. Lastly, you can go back to that slide on the ABCs and just be like, with the exception of external assessments, which they won't have until later, pretty much ask them about any of them. So how's the, uh, how's the IA coming in, in English? How are you practicing for it? That sort of thing. Um, okay. Oh, did we, we, we left out. So Ms. Quintana, I'm going to, um, so speaking of getting involved in CAS projects, Ms. Quintana, I'm gonna kick it over to you to uh, share what you have to say about CAS. And while that's, oh, it's loading up, but I do want to add real quickly, we are going to make this uh, slideshow, uh, or rather this webinar available to all of you um, after, after it's done. We're recording this. Okay. Again, this is, we would love to see your faces tonight. This is a kind of an interesting format, um, but welcome. Welcome to the IB community. I am excited uh, for all your kids that are joined. Um, it was actually a really competitive process. We had so much interest and your your kids deserve to be here. They, uh, one of the things that they all articulated so well is that they all are interested in community service. So it makes my job fun and interesting. 
Um, a little bit about me. I um, went to UC Berkeley a long time ago for my uh, for my bachelor's and then went ahead and got um, a master's in urban planning at UCLA. And I spent the majority of my um, career actually doing project management for a management uh, consulting company that focused on federal clients as well as state and local clients. And so I don't come from an education background. Um, I come from a project management background, which has come very handy with um, the cohorts here. So I've been with uh, IB since cohort one, and we've grown the program and I think improved it every year. And we're trying some new things and I'll explain them in a little bit with, your, uh, with this group, um, considering the new format that we're in. So again, there's my contact. I did put a kind of, a, had a flash picture of my daughters, mainly to show to you that one, I have a 2020 grad who's a freshman in college and um, I have a senior. Um, so uh, in terms of understanding the pools and the stresses of, of your child, I, I'm living it. <laughs> I'm living in my own household. I understand the process. I understand um, a lot of um, also now that I've gone through a whole cycle of the college process to see where CAS fits in and where it can really be an advantage um, as they go forward. So speaking of college, um, let me tell a little bit. There used to be a slide that said that um, they did a survey of colleges and that community service ranked, I think, in number four. So now that we have this this year with the SAT um, being optional, and I don't know what the future of the SAT is going to be, but you can imagine that now community services even probably moved up a bit in, in terms of what, um, what they're looking for. So this is a little snapshot of how colleges would like to see community service, and why I put this up there is this is exactly what we do. This is how we approach community service. So up until this point, you may have been kind of thinking of community service as a collection of hours, something that you're going to need to sign off on or something I'm signing off on where something like uh, that they had to do for Girl Scouts or Boy Scouts or for the National Honor Society. Um, but we don't do it that way. It's not just a collection of, of one-off experiences of our counting. We really are trying to uh, mold kids to having a deep level of understanding and commitment and passion for a cause and so that they develop a project leadership skills um, for that cause. So I'm going to explain a little bit about how we approach it and um, and again that aligns with what the colleges are also looking for. Ooh, I think I have some fancy um, like uh, features <laughs> that I didn't realize I had. So let's go with right away um, what does um, the CAS stand for? Everyone says it and I don't even think um, anyone is really familiar with the acronym as well but I'd be laid out the acronym um, is the kind of work they uh, they want to see how kids approach it. So creativity, um, even though I don't expect any student to come to me with an idea I've never heard of, right? Every student kind of has a unique spin and they bring their own backgrounds and their own values to a project. So it's, it's I don't expect this, you know, this idea that I've never heard of before, but they're going to have their own take and how they want to implement it. Activity. So we build a project plan with a collection of activities that the student is going to, um, to implement um, with one major mission and project in mind or one major focus. So, um, and again, I'll tell you how we do and how we build that project plan and service. So the, the crux of it all is that CAS is about others and not just about themselves. It's about uh, working in an unpaid capacity to help your community. So if, they, if you asked me or any, any Mr. Lewis, Mr. Weber, those that work in the program, what they're really looking for and the kind of work, we're all looking about quality experiences. So we want something that has purpose and challenges the students so that they feel this is a space where they can do something that they may not feel super comfortable doing, but there's room for growth. So it's a, it's a really good, it's a kind of a low risk in that sense that they can explore something that maybe they have a passion for and there hasn't been space in their schedule and it's outside the class. So um, again, we're looking for quality and not um, a collection of 500 hours of something that um, doesn't really uh, stretch the student. So I wanted to put what it's not cast, maybe more to dispel some of the myths um, about community service or what um, 
just so you know what they can and can't do. This is coming from IB. So everything that's already in the IB curriculum, so within a classroom, um, there's not really a double counting. This is something outside of the curriculum. Um, it's, it's volunteer. So if they already are doing something and they're getting compensated for, that wouldn't be CAS. So where that gets a little bit gray is let's say a, a tutor, they're doing tutoring and they're getting compensating for compensated for their tutoring hours. Um, so the tutoring would not necessarily be CAS, but they may be able to use the money that they earned to fundraise for their project. So it just depends on how it is. But again, just the, as a rule of thumb, it's not compensated. And again, just simple, tedious, repetitive work. We're not looking for just quantity of hours where they're maybe just working in a stock room. We'd really like them to stretch themselves and how the kind of work they do for CAS. Um, although I love chores in their fa in your family, um, your family responsibilities are valuable, but not cats. A uh, couple more things. Again, this is um, IB, is that uh, we'd work a lot within religious institutions like uh, your temple, your church, your synagogue, uh, but we don't work where it's prophesizing. It's, it's working on like helping the elderly or the homeless or the hunger with um, issues within that institution. I draw the line with that. Um, political activities, well, wow, this is a really interesting year and we're, we, re we have a couple projects already all about civic engagement, um, getting youth voice, how do you get involved, how do you work within your, even your local um, neighborhood council, uh, but do not, um, they draw the line about working for a particular, um, campaigning for a particular elected, uh, elected office. So you can't be Trump-Biden but you can talk about uh, the issues. And finally, every uh, activity that you do for CAS needs to be validated by a supervisor and the supervisor cannot be a member of the family. So the way we approach uh, the CAS project is essentially like a project life cycle, just like my old project management uh, uh, work. So these are the phases that we go through and I'm gonna talk about how we're gonna uh, do them first semester and second semester. So we fall, the first phase of CAS is the investigation phase. This is where students are going to be researching and understanding the problems that we are experiencing right in our own community, right in the San Fernando Valley. Once we also have an understanding of those problems, they also need to understand their own um, passions and interests and, and strengths and weaknesses so that we can kind of match those two together. And so that they're ready for the preparation phase, which is building a project plan and, um, and their project team and the, and the elements within that, like the roles and responsibilities and the budget and um, the, sort of the structure of the project. And then action phase is them going out and doing the work, sort of the, the meat and potatoes of the project. Overlaying this whole thing is reflections, and that's a big thing for IB, is they want students to be self-reflective to, to, you know, it's okay if they make a mistake or they find a, they are in a pandemic in March in the middle of their project and they need to, to go virtual, they, they, that as long as you kind of pivot and, and um, replan, that's what they want. So they want self-reflection. And so I'll talk a little bit about the writing requirements, but um, it's, a, it's like a journal throughout the process. And finally, demonstration phase. Uh, every year from cohort one through seven, uh, six, We've always had this really big um, showcase in Highlander Hall where we invite teachers and administration and family and we put on a big sort of like a fair style where they can um, demonstrate their work that they completed over the course of a year and a half. Um, last year with COVID, we, we um, instead of doing an in-person, we did a TED Talk where they, um, again, were able to demonstrate the impact they made. So I'm going to just put that as a TBD of how demonstration will happen this year if it ends up being in person or if we do um, something, but it, whatever it is, it's going to be something special because it is an, a remarkable achievement at the end. And I, I definitely believe in sort of traditions like that. So for, for our juniors, um, this is where they're at. They've had two um, workshops with me on Tuesday and um, I am approaching this, uh, this cohort differently. This is my first time I'm doing this sort of format. And um, this format is, is more like because we're doing um, virtual and that the workshops are virtual every Tuesday, it just needs a lot of touch points. And I wanna make sure that they're all in pace and understand 
how to run a project from, from start to finish. And so what I'm doing is I'm condensing the project management life cycle to five weeks. And I've created 12 challenges. And every member of the cohort has been assigned to a challenge group. And they gave me feedback. So they hopefully got their first couple choices of what they wanted to be in. Um, but each challenge is seven to 10 students. And, um, and then we're going to be going at, a, at an accelerated pace so they understand the, what the tools that need to be um, in place before they start their own project. And um, so right now, they have the assignment as they've um, written their problem statement from their challenge. And they're spending this week exploring newspaper articles and TED Talks and, um, and scholarly articles about their, um, about their problem in the, with their local problem. And then when I say problem, it could be everything from a health issue, climate change to um, hunger. So, um, and so ask your student tonight what challenge group they're in and, they, and, they, and you'll have a conversation started with that. Once we finish that second semester, um, we will um, be initiating the CAS, the traditional CAS project, their own project. Um, their own project could be an individual project or it could be with a pair or up to three people. So it's really up to them. And um, if they feel like they've met someone that has the same vision for them or if they would like to work independently. And we structure their CAS projects along, um, around the UN Sustainability Development Goals. And um, those are just the big pockets of things that we're dealing with uh, around the world that we, you know, the values that we're looking at. And so I gave you some examples of this again, poverty, climate change, all that. So uh, once they kind of figure out their passion and interest, they will form their own project. What I found very um, helpful um, is that if they already have a really big academic interest too, that it's nice to um, see, show that they extend that in their CAS project. So I'm gonna give an example, like someone who is maybe a computer science whiz they may end up really wanting a STEM project that they really show that they can make an impact in their community using those engineering um, comp size skills and applying it to a, um, a problem within their own community. So um, just a lot of clever ways. I'm going to interject real quick. Um, I did see a, a raised hand. If you have a question, go ahead and add it to the Q&A um, tab there down at the bottom. I think we've got that open for everybody uh, and we'll, we'll be able to answer them that way. Um, so again, junior year, this is a new format and I'm, I, I'm really excited about it, but uh, we're going to be doing this condensed five week uh, challenge. And at the end of that five weeks, we'll have them each do each team put a presentation together. Um, that I'm probably working out if I want to make it a competition or, or invite parents and um, you will soon know. Um, what, if, you know, I will invite you or, or, or record it so that we can share it with you. And then before winter break, they will be um, already well into writing their project plan for their own CAS project. Now, the CAS project is a minimum of four months. I would say the uh, majority of our students do CAS all the way through their senior year as well. Um, it's just, um, again, having kids as myself, I understand the ebbs and flows. So right, right, when we, right now, our seniors are flipping up, and we've got major deadlines. Um, Common app, you know, is due pretty much November 1st, and, you know, UC apps November 30th, so they're ramping up. So we try to make long-term planning so that CAS is not intense at the same time other things are intense. So there is some ebb and flows with it, and we understand that. So, but over that course, we're looking at about a four-month project. Um, again, in the trad traditional sense, I would say, all breaks are great to get caught up on things, um, uh, documentation, that kind of thing. Um, but you know, with COVID, it's all kind of a blur a little bit, but like, I still like, they wouldn't have class time. So I try to make deadlines for stable CAS is um, completed usually after spring break, give them that last bit to kind of finalize things. One thing I do, I have up here is um, every project has a website um, and, and a blog. And we also show how you would then um, weave that into your college app. Uh, I am, um, again, having a daughter that just went through the cycle. I think she did 17 college interviews. And we also talk about how you can weave cast into the conversations in your interviews as well. Um, my last thing, 
me, uh, project management support throughout the whole the whole journey, and being from you know your 18 month journey in CAS, that we'll be doing very specific uh, workshops on Tuesdays that will we'll cover things like research and grant writing and budgeting and um, website and reflective writing. Um, Mr. Lewis and I both we try to really focus on giving opportunities like handing them straight to students and telling them to apply <laughs> uh, for grants and scholarships and um, summer internships and specialized programs in college. And um, we have some pretty, pretty impressive uh, successes, I would have to say. So we really try to um, encourage students and help write recs and all that stuff to get them into some good programs. So. And then um, finally, doing some of the networking with connections with nonprofits and things like that. Okay, I added another screen there. Um, all right, so we talked about you know earning an IB diploma in the first half. Now we're gonna talk about what it takes to actually get the IB diploma. So this is gonna get a little bit gritty uh, in terms of the details, uh, but I, We'll let you know this is being recorded and we will share or make the recording available. Um, look for an email likely tomorrow or early next week with the, the link for that once I get that sort of sorted out through our network and firewall. Um, so students in order to get the IB diploma have to uh, complete all of their CAS requirements. Ms. Quintana will talk about those later. They have to complete their extended essay. I'll talk about that later. Um, and they have to complete their TOK requirements, which is basically meaning they have to complete the, the assessments in the class. Those are known as the core requirements in IB. Here's where it starts to get a little bit more complicated. Um, students have to test in at least six subjects. So our standard six subjects are English, world language, history, mathematics, science, and an elective. That elective is intended by IB to be arts. And so it could be um, on our campus, our IB visual arts class, or it can be because they understand that there aren't a lot of arts available on a lot of campuses, it can be any other subject from one of the other subject areas. So on our campus, that includes psychology, that includes global politics. And for many of our students, it includes a second science class. Um, I think I might have computer science as well for being one of them. Um, at that, of those subjects, at least three of them have to be higher level subjects. We automatically register our students for English at the higher level, just because English teachers like myself do a really good job of preparing the students to have success. Uh, last year, the lowest score was a four. Um, and at least two have to be SL subjects. Those of you who are better at math than me can see that that only adds up to five, uh, which means that students can elect to take four higher level subjects, but they have to take at least two standard level. Most of our students do three and three. In order to get the diploma, you have to receive a minimum score of 24 total points. That's on that one to seven IB score scale. Um, so we consider, because of this, we consider a four to be a passing score for our IB exams. There are a few ways I wanna be clear and put this out here. Most of these are, are not going to be relevant to your student, um, but I do just wanna be clear that there are some ways that students can be rejected from earning the diploma. Um, so the first and most obvious would be failure. By the way, I should go back a second. And this is with the ex obvious exception of not reaching the 24 points. That that's the most common reason for failure. Um, the, the other, the first failing condition is failure to complete a requirement for the class or core. So not completing an IA would not make you, would you would not be eligible for a score in that subject and therefore not eligible for the diploma. You also have to complete those requirements I mentioned earlier. Uh, less common reasons for failure would be failure to score at least 12 points on three HL subjects. I have seen that happen a couple of times. I've got my cat has decided to join me. Um, these are the joys of working from home. Uh, you can't get a score of one on an IB exam uh, or an IB subject. So I've seen that happen only once or twice. And I know it's because 
the student didn't put in. Usually it involves them, um, you know, sleeping through. Okay. okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Uh, usually it involves the student, you know, sleeping through the, uh, through the exam in May or, um, or, you know, writing nonsense on it or something along those lines. Uh, similarly, you can't get two scores of two or three scores of three. Um, I've never seen either of those things happen. Uh, you know, generally if you're getting, if you're getting... <laughs> If you're getting a lot of twos or threes, um, you're not going to meet, meet that 24 mark threshold to begin with. So those are sort of the conditions that can, can happen, um, that, that can lead to a fail. So we, we were asked earlier, you know, does IB have something similar to AP exams in May? Uh, yes, yes we do. They, they come out this year starting April 29th. So I'm always going to refer to them as the May exams. That's how IB refers to them. We're starting early this year, April 29th. Um, and like AP exams, they're held on our campus uh, in a big room uh, with a bunch of people in them at the same time. So for us, it would be you know our 60 IB seniors for our big classes. Um, maybe some classes would be smaller. Uh, you're probably having some questions about that right now. You know, big room, lots of people in COVID. We'll talk about that. Um, registration for this begins for us in October. So just around the corner. I'm going to be speaking with the students. We're going to be holding workshops to get them registered. Um, so IB, the deadline is November 15th. Our fee and registrations are going to be due October 23rd. We still need to work out how we're going to collect payment from students in this era when students aren't on campus. In years past, it was just take a check to the, to the um, student store. It'll likely still be something similar, um, but we need to, to figure out how that is. Um, the deadline, the absolute deadline is gonna be November 15th. So you see, we're giving ourselves a little bit of a buffer there to make sure everybody gets properly registered, just because as I'm sure you're aware, if you're working from home or doing work remotely at all, things get tricky. There's, there's more complications. So that's what we'll be working with um, to get students registered for those six subjects to, um, to hopefully get the IB diploma when it comes out in July. The fee is $119 per test. I will, by the way, I'll be sending home flyers for these. There used to be a registration fee. Um, there is no longer a registration fee. It's just one fee per, um, per subject. So that's $119 per subject is what that should read, not test. We do, of course, work with students who are on the national um, lunch program. So if your student gets free or reduced lunch on campus, uh, the tests are $5. Uh, that, that is the same cost for AP exams as well. Um, I think AP exams, their prices fluctuate a little bit more than ours do. I think they're really similar. We might be a little 106. bit 106. It's 106? Okay. Um, so, you know, really similar costs. Uh, like I said, there used to be an additional $172 registration fee that um, was, was also tacked on there that I didn't ever understand. Um, IB got rid of that, thankfully, and we're now a lot closer to um, AP in terms of cost. Okay, so why pay for this? Why bother going through this? Well, for one, you know, when I'm talking to students, it's always, there's always the value of completing what you started, right? And getting that external validation. But I know what's on a lot of your minds is, can we get college credit for this? Yes. Just like an AP exam, um, success on an HL exam can earn you college credit. Um, you have to get a five or higher. So the same thing with AP. A three or higher is considered passing, but most schools don't offer credit unless it's a four or higher. Um, typically, a lot of colleges, this is true at the UCs and a lot of other places, a lot of colleges will offer um, students who can get an overall score of 30 on their IB diploma in those six subjects, that's an average of five, they'll give them 30 college units. What it basically breaks down to is if you can get about 30 points on your IB diploma or more, you're going to enter your college as the equivalent of a sophomore. Some schools will grant sophomores uh, 
status, some schools will not. Um, you know, you'll just, so in other words, you won't get the early registration. Uh, sorry, I've got a pit bull staring <laughs> just in front of me. Um, move. So some schools will, um, you know, it's going to vary from school to school. In general, that's sort of how it is. It, it's worth looking to see at your students' schools where they want to go, um, how it's going to work there. For instance, uh, Dartmouth, I believe, doesn't offer any credit for IB exams or AP exams. They're thinking it's kind of like, you come to Dartmouth to take Dartmouth classes. You're not getting out of them that easy. Um, and other schools offer more credit. So some schools will offer credit for fours on HL exams. Some schools will offer credit for success on SL exams. So it all depends on, um, on the university. This is the general uh, note though, and this is true at the UCs as well. So um, this is why this is sort of our standard because most of our students end up attending uh, a UC. Okay, so how have things changed because of COVID-19? You know, everything in the world is going to change. So what's it going to look like this year? I, I don't know. Um, I, I wish we had more guidance. Uh, I think I'm having a hard time being able to tell you what October is going to look like. So predicting the future and letting us know what's going to happen in uh, May is just not something I'm capable of doing. And right now it's not something that IB is capable of doing. But we have some indications of, of what we can expect. So we are going to speculate a little bit, which is always fun. Um, so what happened last year, uh, the May 2020 exams were canceled. Uh, the entirety of the IB subject score, that one to seven score, was determined by, um, by internal assessments and was determined by a predicted grade that teachers send in. Normally the predicted grade doesn't factor in very much at all for American students. Last year it played a major role. Um, they, it, this system worked okay. <laughs> uh, last year, all of our students who completed, with the exception of one, um, who completed their, you know, their requirements earned the diploma. Um, that student who did not, uh, I shall say, what is, you know, what is the opposite of earning the diploma? <laughs> you know, like they earned the not earning of it. <laughs> they, you know, um, so if this were to happen again, it would be okay. Uh, the students still got subject uh, scores and they still got credit for it. Some ex adjustments have already been made for the May 2021 sessions, which begin in April. Um, for instance, most subjects, not all, but most subjects have a sort of lighter load in terms of external assessments uh, for those May exams. So for an English, we have typically have two papers, a paper one and paper two. Uh, it's taken over two days. Um, the second paper has been removed. Uh, the second assessment has been removed. Um, so, and that's, that's similar. So the loads have been lightened in a lot of subjects. Um, here's what is possible. It is possible that once again, um, our students do not sit for exams. If we are still in the middle of a pandemic with a deadly virus, I think it, there's a fair chance that our students don't take the exams. If there is a um, working vaccine and we're able to sort of resume life at normal or, or reasonably close to what we call normal, then um, I think it's possible that we're back in campus um, with distancing in place. I don't think it's likely that our school GHC returns to campus as a whole in the spring for the spring semester, but I think if we're able to, we could arrange to have IB exams safely on campus. Typically the, um, the restrictions for uh, test security, you know, making sure students aren't copying and cheating off each other are such that, um, you know, there has to be a lot of space between students. Um, I think we can, we can do that. And then some this year, um, you know, with only 60 students in the cohort, I can, see a scenario where we have our students in um, Highlander Hall, which is big enough to hit, hold uh, about 100 students for tests. I can see a scenario where we're taking the test in there with the side doors open for some ventilation and cross breeze. It's a nice big open space. Um, 
possibly with some barriers. I could see that taking place. Um, if I were a gambling man, which I am, but there's no, uh, there's nowhere to bet on this. This is what I would bet on happening in May. We'll see though. Uh, so do you still pay for the exams? Yes, yes, because I'd be still going to award subject scores. So we're going to register before we know what those exams are going to look like. Um, not the way I would like to, to do things, but that's the way it's going to be. Um, you know, and again, you still get the benefit of the subject score of, you know, you can get that credit going to college. Uh, as far as I know, all, if the vast majority, if not all of the schools that offer college credit for IB exams honored that uh, last year. Um, okay, so that's the uh, the subject scores. That's the the work that our students are going to have to do to to. That's going to be a big part of the end of the year for seniors. What really gets the spring semester started off and really begins in winter break is the extended essay. Um, those of you who are here for the first half of the presentation, we talked about it. It's a big four thousand word essay, a research project on a subject of the students choosing. Um, we're going to introduce it to students this fall, but students will need to work in earnest on it this winter break. So we do ask, that is asking the families to make a sacrifice here. Um, maybe it'll be less of an issue in this time of COVID, um, but you know, your senior student is going to likely need to, to be doing a little bit of research during winter break. We are working on getting this started earlier and earlier, but the reality with college applications at the start of this fall semester is that throwing on this major essay is, um, is you know, too much to throw on on top of that. Uh, the extended essay, it's a 4,000 word research paper, as I mentioned before, on a subject of their choosing. They're gonna be working with a supervisor. Uh, so last year, I think I worked with five students on essays in literature. Um, you know, that supervisor is going to be a teacher on our campus. Um, in all likelihood, an IB teacher in the subject that they're looking for, that they're working with. Um, we did that last year uh, with, for the first time as our program, and we had good success with it. Um, our extended essay scores were, were good. So I mentioned you have to uh, pass the extended essay to get the IB diploma. Last year, I, I want to say all of our students passed the extended essay, um, certainly all the ones who turned it in. Uh, with the shutdown happening when it did, um, we had students who didn't always handle it very well. So that was a, that was sort of a different situation. But um, yeah, we, we're seeing improvement in our extended essays and how we're implementing as a program. And I look forward to seeing what this group comes up with because we got some really great researchers in this group. Um, so that's that's sort of how IB as a academic program has been impacted. Um, by COVID-19, as well as sort of what to expect in terms of exams and things like that this year. Uh, I'm going to now stop my share and pass it on over to Ms. Quintana, who, um, who will talk about CAS. Wow, what a difference since last spring. <laughs> um, as you all remember from my my meeting of last year, um, I also have a senior going through this along with your seniors. So um, actually CAS is almost a little bit of a silver lining, I think. I have been so blown away by your students, by your sons and daughters, um, how they have sort of risen to the occasion and pivoted and made some super um, effective and impactful projects. So I just rattled off a few on the slide of you know, we, we went in and we're, I'm sorry, my dog is, <laughs> dog is doing what John's cat was doing. Um, so um, we went in obviously at March where, where everyone still had a really nice, a project plan and a, and a focus. And, you know, we didn't realize that it was just, you know, this is going to be our new normal. And so um, quickly students sort of translated some of their activities into some really interesting things. So I listed a few of these, like, we have kids doing podcasts, webinars, blogs, publication, magazine, digital magazines, um, workshops of all different kinds, online workshops, uh, tutoring of young kids in, in, uh, that are doing homeschooling, right? Uh, documentary films, animated shorts. Uh, I have a virtual art exhibit. I think even a virtual museum um, 
the collection treasure box that helps uh, history teachers, advocacy campaigns, mentoring, support groups. I mean, the list goes on. Um, so I'm really, really excited for this cohort. I was um, a little devastated, like, because we had such great plans, but we pivoted really nicely. And um, so the time frame, though, is some students may have felt um, that they need to restart. And they did. And so I just want to be clear right now in this September um, where we where, where they need to be. So um, it's we, we talked originally that it needs to be about a four month long project. So if they got completely derailed and they need to start over and do a different direction, one, they need to reach out to me and I can help them do that. Um, two, there's still time. And so um, everyone on this call, your student is um, able and capable to pass CAS. I want to be very clear. Um, even if they're, you know, we're, we're rewriting the project plan and, and getting them into um, right on a different path. So let me clear, be clear on that. Um, the second part is um, we've kind of eased some of the roads, trying to be very flexible in um, the documentation, things that are, are needed. Uh, this is the core thing. There's uh, three progress reports. There's still reflective writing that they'll be submitting. And of course, validation of the work that um, that evidence of the work they've completed. And I'll talk about how that looks with the students um, from what they do, what they produce. So um, all of that is due uh, the day they get back from spring break. April 3rd is the final final. CAS is completed. Um, and uh, what I wanted to talk about a little bit just tonight is just to emphasize to everyone, because um, I think it, when we get down to the wire now, everyone's like, just tell me what I need to get across the finish line for CAS. Um, is this is what IB really emphasizes. This is their core values for CAS is in these things called the seven learning outcomes. And so I just wanted to just show you what they are. And it really focuses on development of your student. And they basically need to use the work they did for CAS and use their reflective writing to describe how they um, adjust these learning outcomes. That's the core of CAS. So um, here's what the, the learning outcomes are. Did they increase awareness of their own strengths and weaknesses? So these, these questions underneath are really just prompts that they have in their handbook um, of how to write about it. But again, um, do they, are they self-aware? What are their strengths? What are their weaknesses? How did they, how did they kind of discover that about themselves? Um, the next one, um, did they undertake a new challenge or develop a new skill? Well, I think we, most of these you're going to be like, of course. But um, again, they need to describe what was challenging for them and how, um, why, and what skill did they develop through, through CAS. Oops. Now, how do I go back? Okay. Oh, geez. Okay. I don't know what I just did, but okay. Plan initiated activities, the project plan that they were very, very um, methodical and how they, that's a new thing, right? A long-term project um, showed perseverance and commitment. Well, that, I think, again, uh, this, they're showing how they were able to pivot and re, and replan a, a project in this really uh, crazy time we're living in. And so um, I'm seeing that in almost all the projects that I've, um, with, of the seniors I've met with in the fall. And the last ones are engaged with an issue of global importance. Again, we, we focused all our projects on the UN Sustainability Goals, so um, all of them have that. But now they need to sort of talk about what, it, what kind of was an eye-opening experience and how they, what they did kind of um, maybe even just gave them some, I don't want to say like aha moments, but uh, about the, the, the greater community they live in. And then the final one is talking about ethical impl implications. Um, what did they learn about their own values, maybe some preconceived notions they had, and if it was dispelled through their CAS project, and, um, and uh, again, did an issue or opinion change, or even how you approached an issue, did that, you know, was that an ethical, any ethical dilemmas? So those are the seven learning outcomes, um, and the, every student has those. Those are what they're going to be writing on. And those are what they're sort of judged on for their CAS project to, um, um, to pass the, the, the CAS requirement and earn their IB diploma. Folks, if you've got a question, feel free to type it in. Um, otherwise, I'm going to be closing it in probably just a, a minute or two and calling it a night. Thank you very much for coming out.